Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. We are so happy uh, to share this space with you on such an important um, topic. Um, my name is Brianna Diaz. My pronouns are she and they, and I'm the Policy and Legislative Counsel for the um, American Civil Liberties Union of Virginia. Um, and this event is thrown on behalf of the Virginia Reproductive Equity Act. But before we get started, I'm going to hand it off to the incredible Reverend Dr. Lisette Cross to ground us in the space today. It is my pleasure to be here with everyone in this virtual space tonight. In the words of the 1956 South African Women's March resistance song that says, when you strike a woman, you strike a rock. To which I expand to say that when you strike a trans, a non-binary, a pregnant or birthing person, you strike a rock. We are virtually gathered tonight because we have been struck by the pinned words of a leaked opinion that seeks to upend nearly 50 years of protections for persons seeking abortion care. Words that are spurred by conservative political ideology, misogyny, and mere audacity to seek to control the bodily autonomy of current and future generations. But oh dear ones, we are also here tonight, virtually gathered because we have a message. We have words. We too are striking back. We are here tonight to, pe to speak clearly of what is currently the law and the protections to speak truth to power for what we can create together. And dare I envision that we tonight will be able to use our words, our activism, and our collective action to shape a future where all persons can access abortion care and to be free from all barriers and interference. And while we are ready and equipped with these words that come from impassioned stories, that come from what we have struggled and fought tooth and nail to secure, let us also remember that we are embodied people using language that not only slays our opposition, but share sentiments that ring true to the core of who we are. That not only are we brilliant and fabulous and powerful, not only are we the heads of organizations and families and communities, but we dare to have enough audacity, enough strength and enough vision for us to also use our words to our words to paint a world dare i say a city a state a country where the prevalence of the day is to be just is to be equitable and is to seek the liberation for every single person so that no one ever has to wonder whether they're able to access any aspect of reproductive health care rights and justice, but also let our words be a balm, be comfort, be care. Let our words and the language we use also show that we are humans fighting an uphill fight, that we are assigned female at birth persons who are linking arms with women who have had abortions, who have not had abortions, who are yet to be ready to birth the next generation. Let our words be kind. Let, they be, let them be understanding. 
and let them to continue to be powerful because these are not only the words that we wear emblazoned on t-shirts and hats, the words we put on memes, these are also the words that go to make and form the core of legislation and laws that will protect us, protect our bodies, and continue to give us the access to the rights we all deserve. And so, beloveds, freedom fighters, people who have been in this fight for years, who know the moment we stand in, let your words ring out with power. Let your words ring true with kindness. And above all, let your words be saturated with love, with healing, and with liberation. Thank you so much for grounding us with that powerful, incredible speech of truth, power, solidarity, and, and what we know to be true, that the right to abortion is our right and enshrines our dignity as humans. Um, thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Lissette Cross, for honoring us with that speech today. Um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Brianna Diaz. Um, I will be moderating this panel. Um, we have an incredible panel for you today, uh, actually three. Uh, but before we get into it, I wanted to welcome you all and introduce you, if you are not already familiar, with the Virginia Reproductive Equity Alliance, or the, uh, VREA, V-R-E-A. Um, and this is our abortion rights town hall. The VREA is a coalition of reproductive health, rights, and justice organizations and advocates and we envision a Virginia where people and families lead healthy, authentic lives with dignity, respect, and access to the resources needed to support their decisions. And our mission is to build power across differences to secure reproductive health, rights, and justice and advance racial equity for the people in Virginia. Tonight, we have a stellar line of experts, advocates, abortion providers, and service providers, funders, and members of the General Assembly, reproductive uh, justice champions. We have a lot of information for you today and I'm sure you will all have so many questions for our panelists. Um, and so we do have time at the end of this 90 minute event uh, to, to answer your questions. All of our panelists will stay on the whole time. Um, so while we will not get to your questions until the end of the event, we invite you to share them in the question and answer feature or in the chat as they come up. We will be recording on our back end your questions and do our absolute best to make sure we prioritize answering them. Ooh, I'm so excited y'all. <laughs> um, so um, keep that in mind, uh, we are also recording. And with that, I'm gonna um, start our very first panel on abortion and abortion access in Virginia. So on this panel, we are joined by Tarina Keene, Executive Director of Pro-Choice Virginia, Kenda Sutton L, Executive Director of Birth and Color, Kania Haro Perez, a Virginia State Policy Advocate for the National Latina Institute of Reproductive Justice, and Narissa Rahman, Executive Director of Equality Virginia. Um, welcome. This is just the first panel. <laughs> we got two more after this, even more incredible advocates. Oh. Um, I'm so happy to be sharing space with you all today. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to open up with, you know, this panel is going to unpack, you know, abortion and abortion access in Virginia, um, especially as it impacts marginalized communities. And so before we get there, though, Tarina, I'd love to ask for, for you to unpack for us, you know, almost like why we're here today. You know, what is this leaked Dobbs opinion um, that read that came out this week? You know, please unpack what it is and what concerns and implications it has for abortion rights and access in Virginia. Well, thank you so much, Brianna. Um, there's a lot to unpack for sure. Uh, let me start by saying that abortion is legal and accessible in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have 16 abortion clinics and several options for medication abortion via telehealth. So access is actually increasing 
in Virginia. And that's the good news, <laughs> despite the bad news that I have to share as well. We learned on Monday night uh, what we have been fearing for decades, but definitely since the Supreme Court was taken over by extreme conservative ideologues who were handpicked to overturn Roe v. Wade. And now our worst fears are being realized. A leaked draft of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health uh, Organization, a Mississippi abortion ban case, shows that the Supreme Court is about to drop a bomb on us and do the unthinkable, eviscerate nearly 50 years of precedent and overturn Roe v. Wade. This will be the first time in our nation's history that a federal constitutional right has been revoked. That means the right to abortion in this country will be no more. That means the question of the right to abortion will now be left to all 50 states and US territories to decide the legality of abortion. That means depending on where you live in this democratic republic will depend on what rights you have or not. So unfortunately, some states have been preparing for this moment for years and some just in the past few weeks. 26 states are poised to ban abortion either outright or with such onerous restrictions that would make it nearly impossible to receive care almost immediately upon the Dobbs decision being announced. 34 million people who can become pregnant will be impacted. Most of those people who are already living at the margins, lower income, rural, young, disabled, and people of color will be the most impacted. Other states, however, are preparing to be sanctuary states like California and Colorado, and just today, Connecticut, where the governor signed into law protections for out-of-state patients and the providers who help them. 15 states in all have abortion rights protections in place. Vermont will likely be the first state to enshrine abortion rights in its constitution. However, there are states that neither have a ban on the books or protections codified, and Virginia is in this group. While abortion is legal and accessible, our rights in Virginia actually hang by a thread due to the 2021 elections. We lost our pro-reproductive freedom trifecta in Richmond, and now, only one vote stands between Virginia being a safe haven state or a police state where abortion is criminalized. And to be clear, we are talking about a draft of the Dobbs decision. And if this is the final word on Roe, then we must be ready. Here in Virginia, we are discussing what our options, our policy options are. A constitutional amendment is being seriously discussed by our coalition and our legislative partners. And hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that tonight. And at the federal level, the Senate will once again take up the Women's Reproductive Health Protection Act next week. We call this WIPA. The House of Representatives has already passed WIPA and the Senate voted a couple months ago, but it was defeated 46 to 48 with six senators not voting. But they're going to try again. However, the filibuster is still in place and the bill will need 60 votes unless there is a vote to actually lift the filibuster so it can pass by a simple majority. And WIPA would codify the protections of Roe. We must keep the pressure on at the federal level and at the state level to make sure abortion rights are codified and can no longer be in question because bodily autonomy is a fundamental human right. And no one should be able to decide for us if, when, how, or with whom we decide to start or grow our families. Everything is on the line and we must fight like hell every day until reproductive freedom and abortion access for every Virginian and every American is a true reality. So thank you so much, Brianna. I am hoping I answered your question thoroughly. <laughs> Karina, you, you answered it. You hit it out of the park. Thank you so much for explicitly naming that abortion is legal. It is legal across the country. It is legal in Virginia. 
And we are doing everything we can to ensure that it stays that way at the federal level and right here in the Commonwealth. I thank you so much for that succinct breakdown of the point in time we're at and what the leaked opinion is and what we can do to take action. So I'm gonna turn it over now to our other three amazing panelists um, to unpack you know, what this, you know, what this leaked opinion means for the most marginalized communities, and also what a post row in the event row is overturned, what that means for marginalized communities in Virginia. And so, you know, even with row in place, affordable and accessible abortion has always been difficult for marginalized communities. And those are black and brown communities, LGBTQ people, young people, people in rural communities, immigrants, and people with disabilities. And so, Kenda, I'd like to start with you. You know, would you share, you know, who birth um, and color is in y'all's work, um, and your concerns um, that the impact of Roe being overturned will have on the communities you serve? Sure. Thank you so much for. Um having us today, Brianna, and thank you so much, Tarina, for the explicit conversation about what is actually happening, because I know the, the world right now is a, a little confused. And so Birth and Color is a community-based organization that raises awareness to maternal mortality and reproductive health and rights issues. And so what it looks like um, if Roe is overturned um, for people of color specifically is a lack, lack of access. Most of the abortion providers or abortion facilities provide other services that have always been a safe haven for people of color to access. We don't just go there for abortions, we go there for screenings. Um, those who don't have insurance um, can actually go to these facilities and get their services. So if this is overturned, what does it look like as far as funding? And then also they were very strategic about st uh, stacking the Supreme Court so that Roe could be overturned. So if Roe is overturned, how many more rights will be overturned? And in their minds, they're saying like, oh, it's just abortion right now. But if you look at what has been happening, you have critical race theory that has been at the forefront. You have voters' rights. And so people are thinking, oh, this only is affecting abortions, but abortion is healthcare. It intersects with all social determinants of health. It will intersect with maternal health. And so I think that people are saying like you're pro-life, but how can you be pro-life if you're not worried about the maternal mortality death rates? Um, for all people of color, we've always been at a higher st st status um, as far as data and statistic goes when it comes up against pe people that are not of color. So if Black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth, and they're saying, say, oh, that doesn't take away the scars if you have an abortion, but you're not worried about me dying during childbirth. Um, they're actually also made a comment that says, like, if you were raped, it doesn't take away the scars for you to have an abortion. That doesn't give you the right to have an abortion. How, but we're talking about raising awareness to mental health. How can we raise awareness to mental health issues if we're not focused on what is actually happening with the reproductive body? And so you have to unpack all of these things and not just think about abortion and who is accessing them. Because right now, as far as Roe, it has still always been an issue if people of color could access them. Even before Roe, people of color were not even talked about when it came to organizing and getting people abortions. So you have to think about us all being like, okay, we actually need to focus on how we're gonna organize and how we're gonna combat Roe if it is overturned. Thank you so much for sharing all that, Kenda. You're absolutely right. It's um, the intersectionality of abortion access and affordability and how it's, you know, Roe has always been the floor. It's never been the ceiling. It's one thing to fight for that to that floor, but we've never reached our dreams or the ceiling to ensure that the most marginalized folks, Black and Brown folks in particular, um, Black women and Black pregnant people have the access to reproductive health care um, that they need and deserve, and one that is informed uh, and competent to serve um, that community. So thank you for uplifting that and really unpacking and leading us to a deeper conversation um, than just the right to abortion, but bodily autonomy. And with that, you know, I want to pose the question to you as well, Kanea. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Um, um, can you share more about um, your concerns uh, with Roe being overturned? Yeah, thank you so much, Brianna. Um, 
So my name is Kenya Haro Perez. I serve as the state policy advocate for the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. Um, and essentially at Latina Institute, um, we build Latina, Latine power to fight for the fundamental human right to reproductive health, dignity, and justice. Um, and we do center Latina, Latine voices um, because it is a marginalized community that intersects with a lot of other issues. This has, the overturning of Roe v. Wade has uh, a lot of effects, um, especially on the Latine, Latina community. Um, a place where we already saw these effects with a high density of Latina, Latinx, Latina populations was in Texas um, with their recent bans and their recent laws. Um, we saw uh, pregnant people uh, having to go large distances to be able to access care uh, that they were already uh, unable to acquire access for. Um, we also saw these people um, taking days off work, um, loss of wages, um, having to access childcare for other, for children that they may already have. Um, and so, so many expenses um, and these, this community of people already uh, deals with the intersection of lower incomes and uh, not adequate access to healthcare even, not even just services, but healthcare in general um, and insurance. And so we will see a rise in uh, Latinas, Latina identifying people, um, you know, not having care at all. Um, and, and, and it's heartbreaking. And so we will see uh, a lot of people affected within this community um, with, with no transportation, um, with more losses of wages, uh, loss of jobs. And so this will continue to affect this community disproportionately even as it is already. Absolutely, thank you so much again for sharing that. Like I know um, a lot of issues that we see with, you know, like the Latinx and like, you know, immigrant communities is like language access to reproductive health care, right? Again, like just because we have a right does not necessarily make it accessible. And that will always be a work in progress, including here in Virginia, even though we have made tremendous gains when it comes to abortion access. And we're gonna hear directly from the members who have worked on that legislation at the, in our last panel. I see some of them here already. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that. I'm gonna turn it now over to Narissa with Equality Virginia to unpack for us how the post for Virginia will impact LGBTQ Virginians. Yeah, thank you so much, Brianna. And, um, you know, thanks for having Equality Virginia be a part of this panel. We are um, the statewide LGBTQ advocacy org here in Virginia, um, working uh, to put it in, in an elevator pitch, just, you know, full liberation for LGBTQ people. Um, so they can thrive um, being their authentic selves. And so, you know, I first want to say that Equality Virginia stands firmly alongside and in support of our partners of um, at Planned Parenthood Ad Advocates of Virginia and Pro-Choice VA. You know, everyone should have the right to choose what to do with their body. Um, and we often talk about the reproduct reproductive justice and freedom movement separate from the LGBTQ movement, um, but really we are built on the exact same foundation. Um, repro rights are LGBTQ rights, LGBTQ rights are repro rights. And so we can't talk about full, liber full liberation for trans and non-binary people without talking about reproductive freedom. And when you are built on the same foundation, things like rights of privacy, bodily autonomy, you know, the same foundation we use to build ourselves up and on are the very tactics that they're also using to tear us down. Um, so when you think about what is happening with abortion care um, in the country right now, um, folks trying to undermine that and overturn it, those are the same tactics we're presently and currently seeing used to attack gender affirming care for trans and non-binary people. Um, access to that gender affirming care, even attacks on gender affirming healthcare providers. Um, and then also just general bodily autonomy. So these two movements, um, the one to you know, overturn Roe and attack trans and non-binary um, people and, and their healthcare decisions, you know, they're advancing in lockstep and it's not irrelevant and it's, it's not coincidental at all. So it's really critical 
in this moment, as we are talking about abortion care, as we are talking about what's happening or potentially happening with Roe um, and the future, it's it's critical that we recognize that this decision will impact the LGBTQ community, specifically transgender men and non-binary people who um, get abortions too. And you know they need safe and inclusive spaces um, to receive reproductive health care and um, to get abortions. You know, abortion is health care, gender affirming care is health care. Abortion is gender affirming care. Um, and so this can have significant consequences, again, like I'm saying, for trans and non-binary people. But when you add, um, you know, LGBTQ people living in poverty, um, people who might be facing housing insecurity, um, you know, access to transportation, all of those compounded upon each other are, are just going to further marginalize uh, marginalized folks and put them at greater risk. And so um, that is all to say, uh, everyone is going to be impacted by, by this decision, um, including those in the LGBTQ community. And so if there are queer, trans, non-binary folks here on this call joining us um, as the audience member, I want to send a message to you that you know Equality Virginia is is here fighting for your your rights, um, and you know looking forward to working with our partners here in Virginia um, to keep these protections for you. Excellent. Thank you so much to our first of three panels tonight unpacking abortion and abortion access in Virginia. Kenda, Tarina, Narissa, um, Kenneth, please stay on. Um, even though your panel's over, we will have a question and answer at the end. Um, but thank you so much for your expertise and advocacy. Thank you. And with that, <laughs> we are slowly going to turn it over to our second panel. Um, I have more incredible advocates for y'all. Um, Welcome second panel. Um, this one will address uh, reproductive health care and unpack who, what are abortion funds. I know we've seen a lot of social media um, and information going out about supporting your local or state abortion fund. And we have two of many incredible ones here in Virginia joining us today. Um, and so, yeah, real quickly, our, our three panelists in the reproductive health care and a post row Virginia is Jamie, Executive Director of Planned Parenthood, uh, Sarah with, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm getting so excited, um, Sarah, Director of Operations with Hampton Roads Reproductive Justice League, and April Green, Operations Coordinator for the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund. All right, y'all, welcome. Um, Jamie, I'm going to throw the first question over to you. Um, Planned Parenthood is one of the leading reproductive health care providers and has consistently come back with Roe potentially being overturned. Will Virginians still have access to Planned Parenthood's resources? And could you please tell us what you expect in the next year? Yes, uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, will Virginians continue to have access? The short answer is yes. As mentioned, this decision, if it happens, will allow states to ban abortion once the ruling is officially handed down. I am here to repeat what has already been said. Abortion is still legal today in Virginia. It will continue to be legal once the decision officially comes out and Planned Parenthood is providing care. Planned Parenthood stands for care and will continue to provide the health care Virginians need to make decisions about their bodies, their lives, and their futures. We don't know for certain what will happen when the Supreme Court decision comes out. When we look at the national map in terms of access to care, when this decision comes out, it will dramatically impact thousands of people who need care. Some of our neighbor states are likely to lose access like Kentucky, West Virginia, and Tennessee. In North Carolina, a lot depends on the outcome of their 2022 election. So one place people seeking care care will turn to is here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia is a safe haven in the South. And as Trina mentioned, we have tele, um, telehealth medication abortion, which is really expanded access and can continue to expand access. Planned Parenthood is prepared to meet the needs of patients. And I wanna talk um, 
to kind of expand on a little bit of just what, what was said, um, we know that the harm that will come from this decision because we've seen it play out in Texas. People who do not have access to the financial resources and support they need to travel out of state are forced to carry pregnancies or to seek abortion outside of the healthcare system. Barriers to access abortion and other healthcare services have always existed, like finding childcare, taking time off work, and navigating the cost of transportation and lodging associated with traveling hundreds of even thousands of miles. And um, that's not even you know, accounting for the abortion procedure itself. Um, but this decision means the number of people dealing with these obstacles to get the essential health care they need will skyrocket. If you or someone you know needs abortion care, they can visit you or they can visit abortionfinder.org to locate a provider closest to you and also to see about um, what obstacles exist in, in the state. I wanna just end with saying, um, Planned Parenthood providers provide, provided abortion care today, um, will provide care tomorrow and every day after, no matter what. Um, and that Planned Parenthood Advocates of Virginia and with our partners in the Virginia Reproductive Equity Alliance will continue to fight to maintain this access for, for years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jamie. I know a lot of folks probably, I hope feel reassured knowing that regardless of what happens with Roe, that you at Planned Parenthood and your incredible staff and team will be here to continue that, to ensure that folks will always have access to abortion um, and care and other reproductive health services. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we know that getting, like having access to abortion is one thing. And you also mentioned this, you know, transportation, affordability, accessibility to abortion is a whole other thing. And we have abortion funders who are providing, who are filling those gaps, ensuring people have true access um, to abortion as well as the care that they deserve um, when receiving or, or trying to get one. And so I know a lot of folks, again, have seen a lot of information about the funders, and we just want to unpack like who they are, what their work is, and how we can best support them. And so, Sarah, I'd love to start with you. You know, would you share what the Hampton Roads Reproductive Justice League is and the immediate impact the leaked opinion or even a post for Virginia uh, has on your work? So yes, um, we've been around for about a year in Hampton Roads, a little over a year. Um, we're working towards our 501c3 status. We work with people directly to um, find funding through donation and through solidarity requests with the network of mutual aid organizations uh, throughout Virginia, of which there are many. Um, Blue Ridge is one of our partner organizations. We're all working together to make sure that people who need abortion services can get where they need to be, when they need to be with the money in hand and the resources they need to uh, make that happen. Um, we are already seeing an uptick in folks from other states around us who are having trouble accessing services. So this is already happening for many people. Um, it's our opinion that in many ways um, we have to protect each other. The courts, um, while we appreciate all of the work that the policy folks are doing, our focus is entirely on individual people who need services and making sure that they can get those services. Um, a lot of what we do is working to normalize abortion as healthcare, to say the word abortion as much as possible, um, remove the stigma. This is a normal decision that is a healthcare decision that every person who can become pregnant should be able to make. It's fundamental bodily autonomy. And I definitely agree that abortion is gender affirming. All of these things come down to the ability to um, be who you are in a fundamental way. And so um, we work to encourage inclusive language. We work to encourage folks to um, support each other with things like we do um, care kits for folks who are having abortions so that you have some cozy socks and a coloring book and some various teas or whatever you might need, something just to remind people that it's okay, you are normal, you have made a normal decision and we support you. Uh, because I think that in some ways, 
it can feel very lonely even with all the support that's out there because this is a decision that is so stigmatized in our culture. So again, our work is to um, help people um, find, those find those resources and access them and then put them in touch with other mutual aid organizations if we can. If you're unhoused, we might know another organization in the area who we could refer you to. So we try to um, pick up some of the slack where perhaps um, community services boards or other traditional um, ways of accessing resources might be closed to folks. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sarah. April, I'd love to turn the same question over to you. And you know, who is the Blue Ridge Abortion Fund? Y'all's work impact you're already seeing and like, how can, how can folks best support you? We know funding, volunteers, what more can we, should we do? Absolutely, thank you so much, Brianna. Um, my name is April Green and I am the operations coordinator at Blue Ridge Abortion Fund. Um, our organization has been operating since 1989 in Virginia to help folks throughout the state or traveling to the state of Virginia access abortion care. What that means is that we provide direct funding to pay for abortion appointments, as well as logistical support. So that includes um, transportation, funds for transportation, funds for gas, that includes hotel stays, that includes wage reimbursements, that includes stipends for childcare. Essentially any um, barrier that might keep someone from being able to access their abortion care, we are actively working to eliminate those barriers so that people can get the abortions that they need. Um, last year, we helped about 1,800 people in Virginia access abortion care um, with a little over $600,000. Um, and this year we are already on um, track to um, you know, go beyond that number, right? Because this is a need that is growing and will continue to grow, especially as um, you know, more and more uh, regulations are enacted against abortion care. And especially in you know, a world where the floor Roe versus Wade isn't, um, you know, isn't a reality anymore. Um, so at Blue Ridge Abortion Fund, we believe that funding abortion is radical care. Um, this is something that equips our communities with the resources that we all need to make the best decisions for ourselves and our families. And these are life affirming decisions. Um, abortion is a blessing and a miracle. And um, since the leak of uh, you know, this Supreme Court decision, we have been doing the same things that we were doing the day before. Right, we have been funding abortions. We have been getting people to their abortions. Um, we know that the need is increasing. We were seeing, you know, folks from surrounding states come into Virginia to access abortion care, and we are doing the best that we can to meet those needs. Um, but so many of our callers are already living in a post row world. Um, you know that this is why we're here. This is, you know, this has been happening for a really, really long time for our callers, for the people who reach out to us for support. Um, abortion sort of exists at this intersection of cultural stigma and these logistical barriers that keep people from getting the abortions that they want and that they need. Um, and this is just gonna continue to disproportionately impact the people who are already most marginalized in our communities. Um, so what does that mean for us? it means that we are going to continue to trust people to make the decisions that they need to make for themselves and their families by funding their abortions, by getting them to their abortion appointments, no matter what the Supreme Court says. This is what we do and this is what we're going to keep doing. Um, what you all can do is offer sustained support to us. Um, when you know things like this happen, we see a lot of people get really activated and ready to do something to make a difference. We need to see that energy sustained because like our executive director Tana said recently, this is a long game. This is not something that, you know, can have a little bit of attention for a little while and then we move on to something else. We need sustained action. We need sustained attention. We need people who understand that getting people to their abortions and helping them pay for those abortions is critical, no matter what happens with Roe versus Wade. And to echo what Sarah said, we also have to say the word abortion. Um, we are just recreating that stigma that leads to reproductive oppression over and over again when we and the people we elect to protect abortion rights in this, in this country will not say the word. 
So say the word abortion. Abortion, like I said before, is love. It's a blessing. It's a miracle. And everyone deserves to have the autonomy and the self-determination to get the abortions that they need, want, and deserve. Yeah, I just, I have the power to unmute. So I'm just going to clap that. Like everything are, so far seven incredible panelists have unpacked for us. You know, thank you so much, um, our abortion providers, our abortion funders, um, for sharing what access looks like regardless of Roe right here in Virginia. Uh, and I bet, bet people that will be <laughs> donating money, uh, sustained donations. And I invite all of our attendees, we can't see or hear you, but I invite you to just, just say abortion. Just like say it right now, get used to saying it and start saying it in every space you occupy. Um, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> just say it. Like we got to destigmatize abortion, abortion care. And we, and we must, we just got to stop that. All right, I'm getting excited. Y'all are giving me energy at 7.40 p.m. on a Thursday um, in such a dark time. But I thank you so much for your expertise, your dedication, and everything y'all do. Um, we're dropping in the chat. Um, if you haven't noticed, um, amazing audience, uh, links to um, our two funders, Hampton Roads Reproductive Justice League and Blue Ridge Abortion Fund, um, as well as many others that were able to join us tonight, we invite you to check them out and become a sustained donor and support them in other ways. Um, but with that, I'm going <laughs> to transition to our third panel of just absolute reproductive rights, um, abortion rights uh, and access champions. Um, <laughs> we're bringing them on now. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> hi. Sorry, I'm excited. Um, I, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing you all to four incredible General Assembly members who are champions for reproductive rights. Senator Locke, Senator McClellan, Senator Favola, Delegate Herring. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, okay, sorry. I'm going to open it up with some questions for you all. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to start uh, with you, Senator McClellan, um, you know, welcome. And, you know, please let us know, will abortion be legal in Virginia um, after, after Roe, you know, in the event it's overturned? And, you know, what are concerns you will have with access? Uh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you all for convening this uh, important conversation that um, we all feared would happen and, and I think if we you know in our most honest moments especially after uh Mitch McConnell wouldn't even let uh President Obama nominate uh someone to the Supreme Court before his term ended we knew this day would come um for, abortion was legal in Virginia before Roe abortion is legal in Virginia today and if that decision that was leaked becomes final, abortion will continue to be legal. And because of uh, the work that we did in the General Assembly, shout out to uh, particularly uh, Delegate Herring and I did with the Reproductive Health Protection Act with your help, uh, we removed the four biggest barriers to abortion that were legal even under Roe. And that is, uh, we got rid of the 24 hour waiting period, The uh, mandatory ultrasound, the trap regulations. We allowed nurse practitioners to uh, pro to provide abortion within the scope of their work. Um, and so, starting in you know, January one, I'm sorry, July one, twenty twenty, Virginia became a safe haven for abortion, particularly in the South. And we have seen with. You know, even in Texas with the ban adopted there, we have seen uh, Virginia remain a safe haven. Um, so now the challenge is to keep it. We did see efforts in this General Assembly session to outright repeal uh, the Reproductive Health Protection Act to gut it. Um, we, we held the line in the Senate. Um, it is important we continue to hold the line and that we grow our, our pro-choice majority in the Senate and that we take back the House. So uh, yes, uh, the good news is abortion is and will remain uh, legal, even if that court opinion is final. Um, but we're going to have to fight to keep it that way. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for that call to action, Senator, as well as reminding us of our current legal status of abortion in Virginia. Delegate Herring, I was wondering if you would also like to answer that question and impact the work you, um, you've done on securing the right to abortion in Virginia. Well, thank you. I couldn't say it better than Senator McCollin, but I, I mean, I would say that was a very important piece of the legislation. But, you know, I just also want to reflect, though, about um, those who uh, served before we even got there and how it's always been a battle um, to make sure that we're protect, uh, protecting the reproductive health of women. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's unfortunate. And Senator McClellan is right. We've got to continue to be the vigilant. While it's legal here in Virginia, you know, we are unfortunately probably one election away. And it's scary to think about if um, the House isn't running again this year, 2023, um, and what happens with the Senate in 2023. We've got to make sure that we are um, electing pro-choice, uh, pro-reproductive health majorities in both chambers. And I would, I would just also comment that if this is an issue of privacy. Um, this, as you all, the other panels talked about, you know, this, this goes beyond not just health. We're talking about the, the fundamental right to privacy and how far are we going to go with healthcare decisions? What other healthcare decisions are out there that may be subject um, to this type of sort of this, you know, if this opinion is final, um, egregious um, action. So um, we've got to continue to be vigilant and also continue. And thank you for having this panel and reminding people that it is legal here in Virginia and that we will continue to be providing services for people who need it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Senator Locke, you know, I have a question. <laughs> um, so the last legislative session, we saw at least seven anti-abortion bills introduced. And due to the Senate brick wall and specific delegates pulling their bills in the House, uh, we were able to stop a lot of bad anti-reproductive bills from passing. Um, so in a post-Roe Virginia and with an administration that has been publicly anti-abortion, what do, you, what do you think we can expect in a 2023 legislative session? We can expect that those same uh, bad bills will be reintroduced um, in the House and in 2023, and in all likelihood, they will pass the House um, and come to the Senate. But there's good news in the Senate. Uh, those bills will, in all likelihood, come to education and health. Um, and we have a fireball chair uh, of education and health. Um, and we can be assured that uh, our strategy has been to make sure that we do not allow those bills to get out of committee uh, because we can make no promises that they, if they get to the floor, uh, that we can keep them from getting off the floor. So our strategy has been to not allow them to get out of committee. Uh, so uh, we've been, we were able to do that uh, this time around. There was one that nearly got by us. Well, there were a couple. So we diverted them <laughs> to Senate rules where I happened to chair. Uh, so we were able to uh, get rid of them that way. So we're, we're not going to, um, so we're, we were able to make sure that we were, um, that we got rid of the bad bills uh, so that they were not able to get to the Senate floor. So therefore not able to pass. Uh, so um, be assured that we're going to get the Texas-like bill, the uh, Georgia-like bills, the Florida-like bills uh, reintroduced all over again. Uh, but uh, Certainly our strategy will of course be to um, make sure that they don't get to the Senate floor. Uh, but I wanna make one correction uh, to you, Brianna. This is, these are not dark days. These are days of empowerment and making sure that we get out there and fight uh, and, um, and get ourselves uh, in, energized and focused. Um, and um, getting our base energized and focused. Um, because one of the things that Claire uh, said before, she, after she left the ACLU 
was that we may not be able to control what happens in Washington, but we can control what happens in Virginia. Um, and so that needs to be where we put our energy and our resources to control what happens in Virginia. Absolutely. Thank you. I always appreciate the reframe uh, and energizing us that we do have the power to control this issue um, when we show up and vote, when we show up to the legislature and make our voices heard. Um, and when we have amazing legislative procedure <laughs> to, to artfully <laughs> kill some bad bills. Um, so thank you so much. Sarah Kalola, I would love to also ask you the same question. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. No, yes. I, I think I can remember the question, but my Thank colleagues uh, gave really comprehensive answers and answers that were spot on. Um, I will just add that, you know, 75% of Virginians across the Commonwealth in different pockets of the Commonwealth and with different sort of political cultural leanings in these pockets have stated time and again that they support safe and uh, legal abortion care. Uh, and we have to remember that we really are representing the majority of Virginians with our brick wall. And so often we think we're just representing a, a certain stakeholder group or certain constituency. Actually, we're representing a broad swath, swath of Virginia. And we need to get that message out. I believe we have more partners than we realize. I believe there is more uh, energy out there now that that draft opinion has been released. Um, you know, there are two really big um, uh, uh, problematic issues in that opinion. And one, of course, we've talked about where the entire issue of privacy, privacy, autonomy and privacy, which by the way, the first decision Roe versus Wade was argued on the 14th amendment, <laughs> that this in fact was an extension of the 14th amendment. And to say that, um, you know, that that specific right was not articulated in the constitution, the right to uh, abortion care under an interpretation of privacy is very, should be very troubling to everybody. There are a lot of rights that were not specifically stated um, under our constitution that have been interpreted in our modern day to provide the liberty and freedom and, and uh, ability for the pursuit of happiness. So that's very troubling. And I think a lot of folks understand that. And secondly, turning this very important issue over to states um, you're going to have just a mismatch of mismatch of services available. And to me, that is just incredibly unfair. I, I, I mean, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, folks will have to travel to another state to leave their family and friends to, uh, you know, spend an excessive amount of money to access the same service that I'm able to access in Virginia. Um, and that that to me really gets to the goat of what, who are we as a country? And uh, what do we think our constitution stands for if in fact we are going to allow that kind of inequity uh, when it comes to something as basic as healthcare? And, uh, and it'll be very interesting to see how the US Senate, I know uh, Senator um, uh, Chuck Schumer is going to bring the cloture vote um, to the floor, and I probably won't get the 60 votes needed to actually bring back the, uh, the vote on, um, uh, I forgot the name of the act, but it was a health, I think it was the Women's Health Protection Act. So you probably won't get that, that actually to the floor, but we'll have people voting on whether on that procedural vote, and I think we need to take note. Um, I'm pretty confident this whole issue is going to reshape the congressional elections. So that's all I have to say for the moment. <laughs> but I, you guys are making me feel very supported and very good. And uh, I was very distressed <laughs> a few minutes ago, but, but it's been a pleasure being, being with you and part of this. And, and I'm glad that uh, you've allowed me to join you.
no, thank you. Thank you all. I know y'all are so busy <laughs> trying to, you know, fighting with us in your own uh, positions to ensure that, you know, abortion is accessible, is affordable, and that that right is protected here in Virginia. So I thank you for your expertise, your analysis, and everything you all have done and will continue to do. And, I, you know, I, I would love to ask a follow-up question, though, I, you know, I open it to to you all, but you touched on a really good point, Senator Pavola, about, you know, folks will be coming, and our abortion funders alluded to this as well, that folks will be coming out of state. Like, we are a shining star in the South for abortion access, right? And so we have seen this in other states already, um, where folks are being criminalized, like bounties are almost being placed on individuals that leave a state that has banned abortion to seek abortion in a state that has codified or has legalized it, right? And so I'm curious, um, excuse me, you know, we will be a safe haven in the South for individuals trying to access abortion. So we may see a push to criminalize those individuals coming here. So what can we do? What can the legislature do? Or what can we do uh, to prevent that from happening here in Virginia? Well, I know Connecticut, are you referring to the Connecticut uh, law, which actually uh, protects providers in Connecticut if they do pro uh, provide an abortion um, on a, uh, for a woman who is coming from a state that had prohibited it. I believe Connecticut has a law on the books that would protect those providers. I think the point that we were making earlier, my colleagues were making is we are a brick wall, but given the composition of the house, we are not going to see progress unless we're able to turn the control of the house over to Democrats. So we're, we, it pains me very much to say that. Um, but the reality is, uh, fortunately, my colleagues, um, Senator McClellan and Delegate Herring, um, were, were uh, forward thinking enough to get their bills through when we did have a majority in the House and Senate. And we did have a Democratic governor. But now, you know, we've got a big part. We've got two parts of that trifecta that are not with us. Um, and we will not be able to make progress. We're going to have to take all the energy we have to, to stay firm on protecting the progress we've already made. Yeah, let me, let me jump in as, as, as well. I think two, two points. Um, I think right now, making sure that we all as individuals are supporting providers and funders and um, people and organization that provide all the support services that we will need. Um, I used to be on the board of Planned Parenthood. I have talked to um, some of my, my former board members who are still with the board. And, you know, it's everything from, uh, you know, hotel operators who are providing in-kind services for hotel rooms. Um, I think really making sure that we are supporting the providers and the funders and organizations that are providing those support services are critically important now. It's probably going to be the ACLU and and um, and other lawyers uh, who are going to have to step up and and maybe even test some of uh, test the the constitutionality of um, of some of these states trying to prosecute across state lines um, or people here who might try to prosecute. Uh, providers for doing what is legal here. So I say all that to say two things. One, our work is not done on election day or only in the legislature. It is, it is a constant, uh, constant homework, but elections have consequences. <laughs> elections at every level. Absolutely. Prosecutors, commonwealth attorneys, um, local uh, local elections, general assembly elections, definitely, you know, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. And I think taking the time now, especially, you know, we all know people, whether we admit it or not, we knew, we know people who sat the last election out either because it's like, Oh, I only vote for president because that's the only one that matters. Or oh, I don't vote at all. Cause my vote doesn't count. You tell them we are one vote away from rolling back the progress that we made in Virginia and every election matters. And especially now that this battle has fallen back to the states. I agree, I wrote a whole op-ed 
with a, with a, co a colleague from South Carolina pointing out the differences between the laws in Virginia and South Carolina. And I agree that your ability to access abortion or any healthcare, because abortion is healthcare, shouldn't matter what your zip code is. But unfortunately, that's probably where we're going to be. And we've just got to fight that fight. And we also need to understand that uh, we saw this coming. Um, and we saw this coming as far back as 2013 in the Shelby versus Holder case, um, that it wasn't just going to be about uh, women's reproductive rights. It was going to be about voting rights. It was going to be about uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, and that once this all started, um, that every group out there was going to be hit by this conservative court um, and that, um, that, that we were all vulnerable to what was going to happen um, as soon as the November 2016 election was over, um, that vulnerabilities were out there. Um, and so I think that, um, and one of the things, and I, Jen has heard me say this, and Barbara has also heard me say this, that Claire McCaskill said the day after the election, when she was asked, what do Democrats do now? We pivot and punch, <laughs> okay? So that's what we have to do now. Uh, once, the, once we hear for sure what the Supreme Court is going to do, as it relates to uh, women's reproductive rights, you know, we're going to have to pivot and punch. You know, uh, you know, right now, Virginia, uh, you know, we will still have um, reproductive rights in place, but as, as we stated more than once here, we're one vote away from that. You know, and we're going to have to, to make sure that we bolster, you know, our numbers in the Senate, that we regain the house uh, so that we can protect those rights. Uh, otherwise we're going to lose that here in the Commonwealth. So we have got to ensure uh, that we uh, vote from the city, from the school board to the city council races, the Commonwealth's attorney races all the way up. Um, otherwise we're going to be Georgia or Texas or God forbid Florida. No, I know at least one Floridian on this call right now, Senator Locke. Who probably is I'm sorry, Florida. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I appreciate all of that. Thank you so much, y'all. Um, final question and delegate hearing, I'd love to ask you it. Um, you know, what's we've heard a lot about the brick wall um, in the Senate, but you know, what specific actions can advocates here today? do during the legislative session to you know, ensure that these bad bills, these anti-abortion bills don't get out of the house? How can we support y'all over in the house? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Continue to show up, continue to speak out, continue to build coalitions like we, we have. And I, I love that the, you know, the coalition is so big and I, I will share with you, I was on the campus of George Mason University two days ago after the opinion was leaked leaked and you the power and the energy of students of different interests coming together um made such a, a a a loud statement about how this is wrong how um that every sort of fundamental right that we we take um that we have um is at risk and again that 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 right to privacy and, and what it means and i remember in law school i'm sure senator mcclellan <laughs> remembers when we studied about the opinion at, at, in the griswold case and on down and we talked about the the penumbra of rights that emanate and all that that we learned it, it's almost like it was trashed and that's not good because the constitution it's a living, breathing document, as far as I'm concerned, as far as many of us are concerned. And we must continue to respect that. And so if you can help us in the House uh, while we're in the minority, and hopefully not long, is to continue to speak out, to show up. Um, one of the most powerful things that I have that I recall happening was in 20, I think it was 2012, yes, that transvaginal ultrasound bill. 
And it was the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia who came together in silent protest outside the Capitol. And it made such a difference. It brought national spotlight. It brought conversation. And um, unfortunately, we still had a mandated um, ultrasound bill, but it just, it, it helps so much in our, in our struggle for, um, for our health care and for our freedoms. So thank you. Thank you. That's a call to action, y'all. You know, take, show up now, let your legislator know that you support the right to an abortion, abortion access, email them, call them. When the 2023 session starts, you can provide testimony. You can testify in front of these members here with us today and make your voice heard and know that, again, abortion is going to be legal in Virginia regardless. Um, Y'all, thank you so much for your time. We are going to transition now to the question and answer section. And I invite you all to say, we got a lot of questions, but I also know y'all are busy. <laughs> but, um, thank you so much, panelists, uh, Senator Locke, Senator McClellan, Senator Pavola, and Delegate Herring. Thank you. Um, we're gonna bring all the panelists back together. You can see all what, like 12 or 13 of us now? Are we up? <laughs> Give us time. <laughs> Okay, all right. Whew. All right, y'all, we've had an hour of a lot of information uh, thrown at y'all and we got a lot of great questions. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump right in. Now, first question I have for Jamie with Planned Parenthood. Can you please share more about telehealth abortion and how it works? Sure, happy to, to share, share more. So um, there are two ways people get abortions. There are abortions that are done in, in health centers, um, procedural abortions, and then there's also medication abortion or taking um, abortion pills. And so abortion pills um, can be used for abortion up until um, the uh, 11th week in pregnancy. And that's two pills that people take. And now as a result of a couple of things, the Reproductive Health Protection Act, and as well as the FDA lifting some restrictions. And I'm gonna, I just really, I'm, I'm gonna slow down for the interpreter as I share this information. Um, so as a result of the FDA lifting some restrictions due to COVID-19, people can set appointment, telehealth appointments to meet with a clinician, you know, over their computer screen, talk about their, their pregnancy. And as long as they're, you know, confident around the, the, the dating and their pregnancy, they can then get the abortion pills mailed to them for their abortion. And so this is something people can learn about on Planned Parenthood's website, but I know there are also other providers in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia who are providing this care. Um, so a, a great way to in, increase access. And I know um, this is this is newer that this just started. So I think access is not as widely as available as we would like, but something um, that will can continue to increase is is the hope and the goal. Awesome, thank you. And I also saw some of our panelists dropping more information in the chat. So we invite you to look at that uh, for more info on uh, telehealth abortions. Excuse me. Um, okay, I'm trying, y'all, there's so many questions. I wanna make sure we get the big ones. <laughs> um, just to reiterate, April, uh, we have a question for you. What volunteer needs do you and abortion funds have? Um, that is a, a great question. And um, abortion funds are gonna have a lot of different needs depending on, um, you know, what, what those specific abortion funds do, right? So right now, some of Blue Ridge abortion funds um, volunteer needs might include assistance with fundraising. Um, we're currently in the middle of one of our biggest fundraising pushes of the year, the, the National um, Abortion Fundathon with the National Network of Abortion Funds. We engage so many people every year to participate in this event with us to um, connect with their networks and help us raise the money that we need to do this critical work. Um, we also engage volunteers to help us with things like, you know, events and outreach, especially when we can get back out in the community and start doing more of that, which we hope will happen soon. 
Um, we've engaged volunteers to assist with practical support needs, um, as well as, um, you know, translation, interpretation, right? So, so the need is actually pretty great for us. We have a variety of different um, volunteer needs. And um, I dropped this in the um, Q&A thread, but I'm going to drop it in the chat as well. We do have a volunteer interest form on our website um, that folks can fill out to um, just, you know, get connected with us and learn a little bit more about what those needs are. Thank you. Sarah, did you have um, any other volunteer needs you'd like to identify for uh, Hampton Roads? We have about the same needs as um, Blue Ridge. Um, we're always looking for folks to help us um, with our various uh, campaigns and initiatives. Currently, um, we also have a form on our website. I'll drop that in there in a moment where you can um, let us know you're interested and we'll keep you up on what's going on. And um, I believe our next event is May 21st. We're doing a cleanup in Norfolk at Purpose Park um, to uh, get with our communities and, and be present and uh, work with them and let them know that we're here to help. So the more people, the better. So I'll drop that link in just a second. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I got a, I got what might be a legal question. So I'm just gonna throw it out generally and I invite the attorneys on <laughs> to answer it. Um, let me see, I just lost it. All right, so the question is, my friend said that losing Roe versus Wade will mean losing access to birth control. Is that true? Not exactly. Um, so there was a, but no, legally no. However, um, the first case that was decided on the basis of the right to privacy was Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the lawsuit that struck down a Connecticut law that banned access to birth control. So there's, at least in Michigan, two candidates for attorney general who said that they would um, push to overturn Griswold. Um, so I think that this is a real domino effect of what's next, what's the next, um, court case to overturn rights that we've already won. That's point number one. Point number two is there are some forms of birth control that are abortive. And there are, I mean, in Virginia, we, we, we have been very careful with our laws to um, protect them to date but courts could view those forms of birth control as abortion. So the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that's probably the next court battle. And on that note, unfortunately, I have to run to another event and I literally have 2% battery on my device anyway. So thank you all, keep up the fight. We're, we're in this together. Thank you. Awesome. So just to, yeah, thank you. So again, she's not here anymore, but thank you, Senator McClellan for making known that, you know, birth control is contraception is safe now, and we should be cautious of where overturning Roe can lead us. Um, gotta love it when the lawyers give you the yes and answer. <laughs> very, very standard, but all right, y'all. Um, so I have another question. This might be for, you know, Tarina, um, you know, what is the most effective course of action for a regular citizen in this moment and in this movement? So we know that the Supreme Court is not supposed to be influenced by public opinion. So sometimes rallies don't feel like the best thing. So what is, what is the best way, you know, a regular citizen can get involved in this moment? Well, I open this up as well to anyone else who wants to... <laughs> Um, well, I think it depends on your perspective, but of course, uh, rallies and marches also help you sort of release that rage that you're feeling in the moment um, and give you an outlet to be with people that share your values and your principles. 
but that's again, it isn't for everyone for, for sure. Um, but I think that there are definitely ways where you can let your voice be known, especially um, when it comes to your elected uh, representatives. Um, you can email um, or meet with your um, your delegate and your senator and let them know how you feel. About, and it doesn't matter if you know, like I get a lot of this, especially up here in Northern Virginia that says, oh, I just know that Senator Favola is, um, you know, super pro-choice. She, right. she needs to hear from me. And I said, no, 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 she needs to hear from you, <laughs> you know, because that helps them know that you have their backs. Right. Yeah. They it's it's a really powerful thing, even if you know that, um, you know, that either whether it's your senator or your delegate or your member of Congress, you know, it doesn't matter. Now, it really helps when you are in a place where um, someone is is maybe in a more uh, delicate position in terms of <laughs> where their district is. Doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat always let them know how you you know you know where you stand on this issue and also if you have a story tell your story and i know that sometimes that can be really scary um especially you know we know how people have been treated um throughout um the uh the years when it when you when you actually come out but i would love to say that i usually give the um example of the um uh, equality movement, the LGBTQ uh, movement. So the reason we had so much change over, you know, it's, I would, I, it's probably doesn't seem like a short amount of time, but definitely within the last 10 to 15 years, um, you could just see where people started to, you know, come, you know, you know, come out and, and talk about, you know, where, you know, if they, if they were, um, if they were gay or not. And then, People knew, like, this is my friend. This is my, this is my, um, my son, my daughter, my, um, my parents. My, you know, somebody in your, they knew. It doesn't matter. It, it wasn't. It didn't cross the political spectrum, right? It was about people who love people, and everybody knows somebody, and they wanted. You know, I think that that was just a really powerful moment to see where people could be supportive, and that's where policy started to change. Um, I know that we're seeing a regression there, but hopefully we won't. And I think that that is where, at least with, with our issue, is that telling those stories, uh, being bold, being out loud, and is, is really going to help be the game changer for our, our movement. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and let others, others talk too. I, I would just like to uh, chime in on that. And we've got elections in front of us. Um, and we've got three uh, pro-choice lady Congress, uh, Congress people who are running for re-election and they're all in competitive districts. Um, so we need to support them to get involved. They may not be representing us or they may not be close to our districts, but we certainly can organize our our friends go out and knock doors, we can donate, we can write postcards for them. Uh, I mean, I cannot stress enough that the voting booth is our most effective way of sending a message. And it really is the message that counts um, because you're changing the decision makers. Uh, I wish more people had voted, uh, you know, in 2016, especially in those swing states. Um, then we wouldn't have the conservative majority on the Supreme Court that we have today. So elections really matter and they have consequences. So I think that's, that's the first task in front of us. Of course, in 2023, we have all 140 seats in the General Assembly up for re-election, the 40 in the Senate and, and the 100 in the House of Delegates. So that will be another opportunity to really, and a very important opportunity, if uh, what we all expect happens, actually does happen, that, that Roe versus Wade is really turned over to states to make decisions about access to care. So that, that's my message. But I, you know, to your point, Tarina, which is an excellent point about everybody sharing their stories, there was a, 
a, a young woman who had a t-shirt with a big message on it because you know the the uh, TV cameras have been following the demonstrations to try to capture people's uh, feelings and uh, and uh, you know anguish over this uh, decision uh, opinion. And she had on her T-shirt, which was great. Everyone loves someone who has had an abortion. And I thought, wow, that's the message. Oh, there we go. <laughs> well, there we go. That's perfect. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so that's perfect. I, I just, that really spoke to me. And, and I am going to use that regularly because uh, I think it can speak to other people too. That was not planned, y'all. No, I wanted to add one thing real quick. Um, one of the things that I think that we missed the boat on um, is energizing young people and particularly Gen Zers, um, millennials, um, and making sure that they are the um, getting out there and voting in the same at the same level that they did in 2008. Um, they voted in very significant numbers back in 2008. They dropped off in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, but the level that they did in 2008, we need to get that back. Um, and so whatever it is that we can do to energize young people. And this is an issue that we can energize young women around uh, because this is a, will be a loss for them. This has been something yes. that they've had all their lives. Yes, yes. they've never you know, known anything else. They've ne right, they've not known anything else. You know, um, so, we need to make sure that they understand this is something that they are losing that they've always had. Um, and so we need to, uh, what uh, Delegate Herring talked about that she saw at George Mason, we need to capture that, you know, um, and make sure that we're capturing it across the Commonwealth and getting folks to understand that um, we need your support, we need your energy, we need your voices, and that their voices matter. Um, and from uh, that local level all the way up to the federal level, and that they make a difference. Um, because in a lot of time, people are not participating because they haven't been asked. And we have to be the ones to ask them and energize them Excellent. to be out there in the trenches and participating. Right. Excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, our fearless leader. Yeah. <laughs> I work on a college campus. That's why. I know. That's it's right. it's <laughs> great. It came right through. <laughs> it's a great, it was a great commentary, Mamie. leaving space if anyone else wanted to answer that question i'm good i think the senator <laughs> the madam chair said it all she's actually exactly right and i think that that will make the difference is when we right have the younger people mm -hmm. part of this and, and making that that change that, that's so needed and protecting the rights that they've been they, they they've had you're right there that's all they've known um so and may I just add one other thing? You know, we have a couple, we have two very uh, dynamic and eloquent senators um, on the Democratic side, Senator Lucas and Senator Howell. And they remember when women were getting abortions in back alleys where women actually were dying because they didn't have access to safe abortion care. And I think having that generation speak to the issue is important as well. It can become an intergenerational um, movement and should be, but, but having the voices of women who had friends who had these incredibly horrific experiences. Uh, I mean, 
I know Janet Howell has said publicly on the floor, she had a friend who had a, a back alley abortion and then could never have children again. So it's just, um, I think the voices of that generation would be really helpful too. Thank you so much, senators and, and Delegate Harry for unpacking all of that. And Tarina, you, I mean, you kicked us off with the power of storytelling, uh, culture change work, the power of a 2023 election in Virginia. Every seat is up. Um, we have to maintain what we, uh, you know, pro-abortion, abortion right champions um, to ensure Virginia keeps abortion legal. You know, thank you so much for unpacking every action we all can take as individuals. Um, you know, I, we we are in our last five minutes, and I have to uplift that. You know, we have what what, what uh, besides rallies, what we can do, but we do have rallies coming up. And I don't know if uh, <laughs> because like what we're feeling is valid. This anger, this frust frustration, the disappointment, the everything you're feeling, y'all, is valid. And it is okay to want to be with community, to know you are not alone in this, that we have a plan of action, that we are in this together. And so Jamie or other folks on here, real quickly, would you like to plug uh, events that are coming up right here in Virginia? Yeah, happy to, thank you. So um, there were some immediate rapid response events on, on Tuesday evening, and now we're preparing for um, it's what's actually going to be a, a national day of action on Saturday, May 14th. And so right now we're we're planning a um, a large event in Richmond, Virginia. There's also going to be a Washington, D.C. March with um, national partners in D.C. like Planned Parenthood and Women's March, Ultraviolet and others. And then the Virginia Reproductive Equity Alliance is is hosting the event in Richmond. I also know that there's there's other events in the works across the Commonwealth. There's um, an event being planned in, in Roanoke right now for May 14th as well. I just got an email from someone in Stanton who's planning an event on May 14th, and I'm trying to figure out how to um, get them some swag and and see who can help sp speak at the, at that event. And I know uh, an event is in the works for for Norfolk um, in the next few weeks too. So right, kind of stay tuned, a lot of events being planned, um, but um, you know, stay tuned to our, our social media. And I know um, our partners will all be putting out the word about these upcoming events and how we can turn our, our anger into action and make sure that, that legislators are hearing, hearing that loud and clearly that the vast majority of Virginians, nearly 80% of Virginians support access to safe legal abortion um, and you know, bringing our voices together. So there's no question where folks stand and that um, Governor Youngkin and the folks um, who are against us in the House and Senate, you know, not even to think about trying to introduce similar bans to other states here in the Commonwealth. Excellent. And I also want to uplift in the chat that Pro-Choice Virginia has her annual gala coming up. Like there are so many opportunities to connect with us, y'all, like outside of Zoom. Um, so come join us if you are able to, if you feel safe um, and affirmed to be in the space, come out, be with us. But y'all, it has been 90 minutes of just incredible information sharing of, of your expertise and advocacy. Again, abortion is legal now across the country. Abortion is legal in Virginia. If Roe is overturned, abortion will still be legal in Virginia. In Virginia. Access to abortion is, abortion is accessible in Virginia. And we have incredible advocates in the Virginia Reproductive Equity Alliance and these incredible legislators here with us tonight fighting on our behalf and, and in partnership with us. Y'all, thank you so much. Um, I Thank you for joining us. And I really look forward to uh, working together in these dark, sorry, not these dark times, Senator Locke, not these dark times, this moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Pivot you. and punch. Pivot and punch. <laughs>